Good afternoon, and welcome to Policy at DEF CON. I am Heather, I am your room host, um, and this is Demystifying Hacking for State Government Officials. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, this talk is being hosted on the record. Um, as a courtesy to speakers, please make sure that you uh, set your cell phones to silence. Um, we will have questions at the end. Please use the microphone. Uh, because this is recorded, we want to make sure that everyone can hear it on the recording. Um, as a reminder, the photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the explicit permission of everyone in the frame. That is not something that everyone in the audience has done. So please, please be careful. Um, and uh, with that, let's get started. I will let uh, Lindsay Folson introduce the panel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I know we're the, the last panel of the day, so we'll try to keep it brief and um, not too boring. Um, we're here to talk about demystifying hacking for state government officials, which has been a collaborative effort of members of the National Association of Secretaries of State. Very quickly, I want to introduce my panel. My name is Lindsay Forson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the National Association of Secretaries of State, which is the last time I'll say that. NAS is our acronym. Um, I have with me Jack Cable, Senior Technical Advisor for CISA. Michael Ross, Deputy Secretar Secretary of State and Chief of Staff for the Iowa Secretary of State's Office, Jason Ingalls, Founder and CEO of Ingalls Information Security, and Brad Manuel, Chief Information Officer for the Lu Louisiana Secretary of State's Office. I know this is an on-the-record session, and so I want to note that only my remarks um, may be attributed to NAS, and each panelist's remarks may be attributed to their individual organizations. So very quickly, what we're going to talk about is um, background and history on demystifying hacking for NAS members and, and those they work with. Um, the idea of Michael Ross here to bring a hacker con to NAS impacts and other efforts of, of these efforts, state perspectives, and lessons we've learned. And then we hope to get the whole room involved in some brainstorming and discussion. I want to very quickly talk about who NAS is. We are a membership organization representing secretaries of state and in a few cases where there's not a secretary, lieutenant governors across the country. Um, secretaries of state, I, I mentioned this this morning, we're, we're not the US State Department. We represent the secretaries of state in each individual state who have many roles and responsibilities, not just elections, as many think uh, is, is that their only role, but about 40 members of NAS service their state's chief election official. So that means they are legally, it's a, a legal designation where they oversee election administration in the state. And what exactly it means varies dramatically state by state. NASA's role is to, ser to serve as a medium of exchange for the, for the Secretary of State offices. We act as a conduit of information sharing between the states and their federal government, partners, other partners, and even more importantly, our, our most important role is sharing ideas and information, lessons learned across the states and, and territories. As I mentioned, secretaries do more than just elections, um, and we have initiatives in the major areas of overlap across the Secretary of State offices. They all do something a little bit different, but these are the areas where they, they tend to have um, similar responsibilities across the state, and so that's where NAS focuses its attention. Elections and voting, cybersecurity, business services, so that's registering and renewing businesses in the state, sometimes providing information and resources to businesses, particularly small businesses, state record keeping and archives, and more. So, why have we been focused on demystifying hacking for, for members as an association? Um, as you all know, the 2016 elections heightened attention of cybersecurity in election administration. Uh, previous to 2016, cybersecurity was a thing that all Secretary of State offices were focused on in some way, but that dramatically increased after the 2016 elections when there was nation state targeting of the internet connected infrastructure that relates to voter registration. 
Um, in 2017, elections were designated critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security, and that really changed the, um, the attention that was given to election cybersecurity by the federal government, but also by the public. Um, and that led to increased security research attention on elections and on Secretary of State offices, including the launch of the Voting Village here at DEF CON. Um, we'll get into this a little bit. Let me not get ahead of myself. Um, so we'll get into this a little bit in just a minute, but a as many of you all know, the, the initial relationship between NAS and its members and the election community as a whole and the security research community got off to a rocky start. As I know happens, I'm learning here, happens with just about every single industry. Um, and so we, we, we began focusing on relationship building and education between the election administration community, particularly NAS members, and the security research community. I started with NAS in 2018, and that was one of the first things I was tasked with. And so I just want to provide a little bit of background on the work that we've done to bring us up to today. So one of the first things we did is look to, you know, good models, like where, where is there a good positive collaborative relationship? And everybody pointed us to medical devices. And so we got in touch with and the cavalry, Bo Woods, and brought him out to NAS. Um, we got connected with Jack and, and, and several other um, independent security researchers. And, and initially, it was an education effort, right? Um, we wanted to learn, NAS wanted to learn more about what, who hackers are, what you do, what motivates you. And so initially, it was an education effort. That kind of morphed into a focus on networking and relationship building. We started hosting meet and greets between the cybersecurity staff and the secretary's offices and um, some folks in the hacker community. And then that really led us to where we are today, which is um, you know, really bringing hackers to NAS, trying to um, bring a sample of what is going on here to our conferences. And, and, and that's why we're here today, because we're, we're really interested in hearing from you all on you know, good ways to build off of those efforts. I'm going to ask Jack to provide a little bit of perspective on the, on the background and history from the hacker side. Thank you, Lindsay. And first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming um, on 5 PM on a Friday night. I know we're the only thing between you and happy hour, so we'll hope to keep this engaging and maybe chat with some of you there. But as Lindsay alluded to, really, there has been a storied history uh, between hackers and the elections community. And uh, happy to say now we've made quite a bit of progress, something we, we couldn't even have said, say, five or six years ago, where I, I think especially after the 2016 election, there became a recognition of how crucial security research was to um, helping build security into our elections. Um, and something that has, has been reflected through the work at NAS, um, th through work elsewhere as well. Um, we see it in the uh, DEF CON community as well. Um, but um, I, I also saw this myself, where I come from a background as a security researcher, uh, later ventured into some of the policy world. Uh, but my foray into elections was when I was 18 and registering to vote for the first time in Illinois and came across a pretty serious vulnerability in the Illinois voter registration database. Um, as someone who didn't know much about how elections were administered in Illinois, uh, took uh, quite a bit of uh, discovery to find even someone to report that to. Um, and through uh, the likes of CISA, was able to eventually find a contact, eventually was able to get that vulnerability patched. Uh, but through that, saw really the, both the benefit of collaboration. Once I got in contact with uh, the Illinois Board of Elections, they were very grateful for that, but also the necessity for there to be strong pathways between security researchers and election officials to ensure that um, when vulnerabilities were found, um, security researchers were able to make that known. So since then, we've had some remarkable progress. We're now up to, by my count, five states, um, including Iowa, Ohio, um, uh, North Carolina, Idaho, 
um, and Minnesota who operate vulnerability disclosure programs, allowing security researchers to report vulnerabilities um, they've found in their systems. Um, the majority of major voting machine manufacturers also operate vulnerability disclosure programs. Um, so we still have progress to be made, uh, but really we are light years ahead of uh, where we were even a few years ago. Um, and I'm excited to see um, states and election uh, manufacturers alike really welcoming uh, security research um, to, to help secure their systems. Thank you, Jack. And I, I think we're going to continue to see that number growing here in the very near future on states with vulnerability disclosure programs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it down to Michael in just a minute. But after Michael's first trip to DEF CON, um, Secretary Pate, who, who's here with us, was, um, was our president at the time. And he was hosting our summer conference coming up. Um, it was 2021. So pandemic, summer conference, already really busy. And Michael gives me a call and says, I want to bring DEF CON to NAS at the summer conference. And so um, I'll, I'll let him talk just a little bit about why and, and what we did. So I woke up one day and discovered we were part of the uh, critical infrastructure. And I had no clue what that meant. I had to Google it. and. Uh, Honestly, the federal government didn't know who ran elections, and so they had to kind of figure that out, too. And so we started off pretty rocky, and then I woke up another day, and a nine-year-old kid had hacked the Secretary of State's computer system and changed the election results in less than three minutes. And that was a little bit of a surprise, and so we weren't quite sure that was quite accurate. And uh, so just hearing that, uh, we had the opportunity to, uh, Secretary Pate allowed me to come out to DEF CON, and it was really kind of uh, suspiciously and, and, and kind of in a guarded way, and what the heck is going on, and who are these people, and what are they doing, and how did they hack it in less than three minutes? And, and uh, uh, But what I discovered, and I came back to Secretary Pate, is that uh, what I thought the White Hat hack, what that community was, was not what they were. I found them to be uh, patriotic. Uh, they aren't anarchists. I mean, maybe there's one or two anarchists out there in the crowd, but the majority of, of, of you guys were really, uh, uh, elections are important, and you guys see things differently. And so we just kind of wanted to go that next step. You know, we had breakfast with Bo or lunch with him to kind of discover a little bit more about you guys. And as we started to kind of trust that, we started to look at what can we do uh, because we have both cybersecurity, you know, the, which is you know, the critical part, but we also have to reassure the public uh, that elections are secure, and that you know is also a critical piece. And I think that the uh, uh, white hat hacker community uh, plays a part and helps us uh, do both of those things. And So based on Michael's idea, we created an, an event at NAS that we now call Hacking Demystified. Um, and, and I called up, as soon as Michael came to me with that, that idea, we got on the phone with Jack, with Bo, with a couple of others who are organizers here at DEF CON. And um, we're like, you know, Iowa wants to bring, de bring a hack hacker con to NAS. W what do you think we should do? Um, you know, recognizing that most Secretary of State offices didn't have representation at DEF CON. Folks had never been here. And um, their idea was like, let's start with some of the fun stuff. Let's start with some of the low hanging fruit, like less intimidating things. And so we brought a mini lock picking village, soldering village. We had IoT hacking village. We had um, ju just opportunities for NAS members, their staff, and the folks we work with to get a taste of what goes on here. And you can see um, some, of, uh, some of the fun activities that happened at our first event in Iowa up here on the screen. And then you know, we got a lot of good feedback. We got a lot of constructive feedback. We learned um, a lot from that event and decided we wanted to build on su the success. And, and up next was Hacking Demystified 2.0. But I want to um, ask Jason next. So Jason is, Jason's company is a corporate affiliate of NAS. And they have been incredibly supportive, both financially, but even more importantly, um, operationally, with running these events. They, they've um, lended so much volunteer staff support to making this happen. And so I just want him to talk a little bit about the importance of these events and why you've been so supportive. 
Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. And, and thank you all for being here. Um, so we got involved uh, in NAS as a sponsor and we're going to Iowa for the conference and we realized there's a hacker conference going on during NAS. We're like, we gotta get, we gotta be part of that. So, um, so we got to be part of it and we're, and then, you know, we're thinking, well, what do we do about uh, next year when we go to Baton Rouge? Because uh, we're a Louisiana-based cybersecurity services company. And so uh, we thought about, we do a lot of breach response and we thought, hmm, might be helpful to do uh, something about ransomware because, you know, people hear about it in the news and, um, you know, I, I kind of think of it as like the digital equivalent of an AK-47. You can do a lot with it. Um, so we wanted to make sure that people understood the basics around how that happens and what happens after everything gets locked down, et cetera. And um, we were able to think through and produce kind of this, um, you know, uh, narrative with everybody's help. Uh, we were able to put it together. But more important than that narrative for us was the opportunity to get universities involved uh, and, and to get like students who were in cyber majors to come in and participate. That again, you know, was something that we picked up in Iowa. Uh, with the universities co contributing uh, labor and support uh, in Iowa, we were able to do that with some of the schools in Louisiana. Um, and I, what I saw there was kind of this wonderful combination of government, academia, um, industry, and, uh, and and interested parties. And um, it was a really positive experience for everybody. Um, folks got to make you know connections and discuss things. Uh, where there probably wasn't a lot of overlap before, um, they realized where that might lie afterwards and, and how they might be able to connect and start discussing ways to help protect, you know, this critical infrastructure that, that underlies democracy. And Brad's office, the Louisiana Secretary of State's office, was, again, I think, president and host of this conference, NAS president and host of this conference, and, and so Brad was one of the key planners. Anything you want to add about the event in Louisiana? So <clears throat> Jason kind of stole a lot of my thunder there, uh, but you're good. So anyways, in, when they brought it to us and the topic became ransomware, it fit uh, very well with where we were because uh, in 2019, Louisiana was, uh, was struck with ransomware statewide uh, pretty heavily during the school, uh, their school board. And it all occurred right around an election, which created a, uh, a, a narrative that uh, was, was false. So we wanted to take and demystify, uh, it, it worked perfectly, uh, demystify the, the thought process behind ransomware and understanding that, uh, that there is a, a uh, structured response to any type of incident. Um, and then also bring in, like Jason had stated, bring in the uh, education uh, portion, uh, bring in volunteers all over the place security researchers, and just keeping that, that uh, line of communication open uh, is, is really what we were trying to push forward, and, and I think it was a complete success. Agreed, and I, I do think Louisiana is the most collaborative event we've had, where we had, you know, we had several hackers there, we had uh, aspiring hackers, we had a lot, a lot of different folks involved in that one, and in this scenario, we did introduce uh, a vulnerability report from a security researcher so that folks would have the opportunity to understand kind of how that would be handled if you have a vulnerability disclosure policy versus if you don't. Jack, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yep, so it really had two main goals with the event. The first, as Lindsay mentioned, was to put attendees in the shoes of hackers. Um, and I imagine many people in this room have been in the scenario where you find vulnerability, it's really serious, and you know it needs to get into the right hand so it can be fixed. Um, and how challenging it can be without having a defined point of contact, not knowing who to disclose it to, um, because every day that this is out, there is another chance that can be exploited. Uh, so putting participants in the shoes of security researchers to understand the value of, say, having a vulnerability disclosure policy, being able to have a channel where you can report it, being able to have a legal safe harbor that um, assures you that no legal action will be taken for the good faith reporting of a security vulnerability. Um, I think really uh, it was crucial to kind of helping attendees understand the importance of that. Um, and then the second part was to really show that a lot of these vulnerabilities aren't these kind of crazy complicated attacks that um, only kind of top experts can understand, but the truth is the vast majority of vulnerabilities attacks 
are quite simple, uh, leverage uh, sorts of vulnerabilities that um, are repeated all over the place. Um, so being able to demonstrate that and kind of in combination with the fact that applying a few relatively simple defenses can help uh, block off entire paths of attacks, um, we, we hoped would be able to kind of help paint the picture that security isn't some insurmountable thing, but rather uh, by taking some pretty basic steps can um, eliminate, especially with ransomware, which is uh, financially motivated targets that the most simple vulnerabilities um, can, can prevent a lot of that. Thanks, Jack. And yeah, yeah while, while many Secretary of State offices developing vulnerability disclosure programs and getting to that level of maturity is a positive thing, we also wanted to show, like, even if you don't have that and you get a vulnerability report, it doesn't mean panic, right? These are some of the ways that you can work through this. And um, Jack did a great job working with states on that. Um, we also, after the success of this event, really saw a lot of interest from others. Um, the National Conference of State Legislatures, for example, reached out to us and NAS sat down with them and um, helped them plan, you know, get started on the planning of an event like this. We've seen states take the idea and run with it, and so it, it really is evangelizing a bit. Um, and so our, la our most recent uh, Hacking Demystified event was at this last summer conference. We were in Washington, D.C. And as we um, were planning Hacking Demystified 3.0 and trying to pick a theme, one thing that we could not ignore was that we had many new secretaries of state. Um, and, and some of those folks were new to the elections community um, and, and their staff as well. So we, we didn't want to you know, get into a more complicated topic. We kind of wanted to go back to basics and, and we chose behind the breach for this topic and Jason really helped kind of lay out the strategy for this so I want to turn it over to him to talk yeah, about thanks. it. Yeah, so um, you know, we, were, we were trying to really tell a story about, okay, um, you hear about data breaches, um, Let's let's talk about the various different ways that they can happen. Let's talk about the kind of impacts that they have. Let's talk about how people can identify ways to respond, how to reach out for help and educate, uh, essentially, uh, folks on you know the the risks of of a data breach happening and then what to do about it. And we had scenarios where you know we had um, and we we of course you know because LLM AI is the new flavor of the month thing that everybody wants to talk about. Um, we, uh, we had to talk about a scenario that involved that. And um, we also had other examples uh, of, you know, email phishing and just your typical types of, of you know, entry vectors for bad guys to, to get in and, and wreak havoc. Um, and, and just being able to, again, have government, academia, industry, and other interested parties participate in various scenario parts uh, was very helpful. I mean, I, I thought that um, people got a lot out of it and they were able to, we, th this time, I guess the thing that I would say was a little different was we had folks moving between stations, almost like a spoke and hub system. So, you know, they'd go to the station, they'd go back to like center base, they'd talk about what they, what they heard or what they saw, and then, you know, that would lead them to the next section. And so, uh, you know, whereas like Hacking Demystified 2 was more of a serialized thing where people went through these stations, um, three was more of a hub and spoke type thing. Um, you know, I think that um, people probably got more out of that because they were able to, um, you know, essentially pick your own adventure, but it was somewhat controlled in the sense that um, y you were able to get some information, part of the scenarios, go back, discuss that, put the whole picture together, and then kind of add to that over the course of it. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, this one, this one was a lot of fun. Um, in terms of the activities, and we, ha we had a lot of secretaries involved. We had a spear fishing competition, which was, uh, the competition was fierce. Actually, Brad down here was one of our winners, um, one of our master spear fishers. Uh, okay, so I wanna move along so we can open up the room. So really quickly, I'm gonna ask states to talk about, just kind of in this light, some of the things that you've taken and run with, either, um, either leading into this or, um, or a, as a result of some of these collaborative activities. So I'm gonna turn it down to Louisiana first and um, just to talk a little bit about your collaborative approach to resilience in, um, in Louisiana. All right, so this event uh, basically has opened up doors for uh, community, 
continued communication, uh, whether it be with, uh, with third party vendors or um, educators or researchers, it's opened that door for us to have that conversation. Um, it's allowed us to realize the, uh, the need for having internal security as well as uh, a, a, someone else looking out a 24 seven sock. Um, it's opened up conversations for, for even, even within NAS on other states. Uh, that, that's been a, a huge effort uh, for us to be able to call on another state to say, hey, are you seeing something like this? Uh, what are you reacting uh, to right now? Maybe I'm seeing the same thing. Uh, it, it's, it's been great on, on that effort uh, as far as opening up doors is the biggest thing for us. Awesome. And then Iowa has been one of the states that's really led the way in the NAS community at embracing security research. And so will you just talk briefly about that? So we've been encouraging other secretaries of state, but also even within the state of Iowa, other agencies to, to put together vulnerability disclosure policy to invite researchers to come and to look for vulnerabilities. I think two reasons why I think that's important. Uh, number one, we've had the feds come in and do a pen test, and we had the Iowa Guard come in and do a pen test, and then we had a private company come in to do a pen test, and then we open it up to researchers, and you guys find vulnerabilities. I'm scratching my head. How come you guys find things? I think you guys, are, you're wired different. You see things differently. You're puzzlers. You, you, you know, have different perspectives, and I, th I think that's, that's important. And then second, we want to reassure the public, because if I'm government and I say government says we're good, some of you are going to say, oh, yeah, government says we're good. Yeah, right, it's you guys. And I think the, uh, for us to be able to say, but we're also inviting white hat hackers, researchers to come in, I think also helps to reassure uh, some people that, yes, not only is government, not only is, you know, are these uh, um, the military and those folks helping out, but also researchers are. And so we just went with the bug bounty program. It's the, uh, I think the first secretary of state, but the first agency in Iowa. Uh, we've had positive results. There's been a couple of things that, that they found that was out of scope, but, uh, so it didn't affect us, but they were some fairly major ones for some other agencies. So we passed it on to them and also encouraged them to do a bug bounty program. Um, and I think one of the, the areas that we're probably looking at next is about half of the counties in Iowa don't have an IT. And, uh, or uh, the janitor's kid is the IT director. It probably does a really good job. And so part of our challenge is how can we help those counties without an IT infrastructure? And I don't know how we involve or work with, with your community, but I think that might be part of the solution you know, down, down the road, you know, how to do that. We are doing another bug bounty with three counties, uh, and the results are going to go to all the county IT directors, and we're, our suggestion is if three counties get the same vulnerability, you probably should do something immediately. And, uh, but again, I see that challenge in the future. How do we uh, maybe work with you to figure out how do we assist those counties? We have some counties, 5,000 people, more dear than there are people in the county. And so they don't have, you know, $100,000, $300,000 budget for IT. Uh, and, and so I think we need to kind of figure out how do we work with you and with others to, to assist them in that. Okay. Um, I, I know everyone is, is ready to get the party started. So I, I'm going to quickly go through this part and then we'll open the room up. Um, so lessons learned and, and recommendations uh, for folks in the room. Um, coordinate directly with the, the folks who are implementing and overseeing systems, right? I, I think that um, it, it's not always easy and you don't always know where to go, but I encourage you, if you're, if you're looking to support government with your security research, try at least to coordinate directly. Um, I think that both sides will find it a more productive relationship. On that note, it's really important to meet each other where we are. I think that, you know, when, when we say that the relationship between, you know, policymakers broadly in the security research community or the election administration in the security research community got off to a rocky start, there were just a lot of misunderstandings on either side and not understanding each other's role. 
And, um, you know, it's really important to meet each other where we are and, and have conversations and get to know each other and respect each other's expertise and be willing to learn something from each other. Um, and then, of course, you're, some of you are probably thinking, like, I don't think hackers in the election community have a perfect relationship. No, that's not the case, right? Collaboration does not eliminate disagreement. We are still going to make each other nervous, right? But um, it does increase the value of the work that you're doing. And, uh, and so at this point, we're going to open it up, and we'll, I, we can go down the line again if, if we don't get a lot of questions. But um, I do want to note, we didn't... This wasn't our focus today, but demystifying goes both ways, right? Just like um, policymakers or policy implementers or election administrators don't understand exactly the work that you do, um, you all don't exactly understand the nuance of the work that we do, right? And so um, try to understand. Reach out to the people who can um, give you that trusted information, who can break it down for you, explain it to you. Um, NASA is always available to connect folks with their own mem with their own secretaries of state. We're always there to give the like national one on one hundred and one on um, how elections are run in the U.S. and what a secretary of state is. So um, please be open to having the work of government demystified for you, just like we're very open to having it demyst having your work demystified for us. Um, and with that, I just, I wanna open it up. First, we, we can take questions, but I also put um, some prompts up here where, you know, we, we wanna have a bit of a conversation. So some things we wanna think about are, um, you know, what are like remaining misconceptions you think that um, we have about your work and, you know, what's the most important thing that you wish government officials knew about what you did? Um, or if you're a government official who wants to add kind of to the conversation here. So um, how do we continue to improve collaboration? Uh, from the NAS perspective specifically, we've done these three events. We've done the, a lot of networking. We'll continue to do work, but kind of what's the next step in this process? We want to hear from you all. So go ahead. And please use the mics. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, I'm I'm from Baltimore. Um, like, it was really well publicized, but in 2019, Baltimore got uh, affected by a really significant ransomware attack. Took down like a significant significant portions of our IT system, and then there's been like routinely ransomware attacks against medical databases and a whole host of other things. And I think, in response to that, or in the midst of that, Larry Hogan made like a, a pretty significant investment in creating a director of cy cyber resiliency with like a decent budget attached where they can sort of like run um, like, like red team, like there's a contract for like a red teaming company to go in and sort of like try to maybe also run, uh, essentially try to influence the IT system to increase its resiliency, um, but with a dedicated like significant budget to, to do that as well. And I'm just kind of curious from y'all's perspective is that something that you see in the conversation at other states, um, potentially making similar investments. Thank you, I'm from Baltimore as well, so. Hey. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll let the states weigh in on this one. All right, so um, Louisiana has, has taken effort since 2019, we also, uh, our school board was hit with uh, ransomware across the state, and the state identified that we needed some sort of uh, dedicated cyber response, right? Uh, so the Louisiana Cyber Sec uh, Security Commission was created, uh, and under that, the Louisiana, Louisiana National Guard is an incident response team, is kind of what it's built as. Uh, and then the election, uh, there's an election security committee on that, which, which I sit on that as well. So that was one of the responses. Uh, and each year, legislation is passed to, to present more in the budget. Um, and just this year, uh, that commission was an executive order, uh, but just this year, it is now legislative and mandated. So we're taking a serious effort. Uh, at that, we understand uh, that that it's it's needed, um, and we keep putting where, our money where our mouth is on that that front. I just and, and yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I think maybe that's an area we might be going into. I think one of the things too that that you need to know is that elections in each state are probably a little different, and even within the state of Iowa, we have 
uh, the federal elections, but we oversee the elections. We also have counties. Uh, our our uh, um, voter registration file, we're in charge of that, but the counties have to do certain things by law, and so we've you know, had kind of work in, in that area. We've, we've worked with our state to uh, get endpoint detection uh, on every piece of equipment in the auditor's office. We were able to do that, you know, working with our, our state OCIO. And so I'm, I'll bring that up to our state OCIO about putting together or seeing if there's any contract possibilities to actually putting together some red teams to try and do that. So that's a great idea. Anyone else? Who's up next? Trevor Timmons. Um, so you mentioned that you brought in folks from uh, universities to kind of help these sessions, trying to bridge the divide maybe between government officials and the cybersecurity research community. I mean, have you seen some examples of where that may be uh, paying off in the future, or do you see some potential for where that might go in the future? Go yeah, for it, Jason. Happy to talk about that. Um, so, you know, everybody talks about the job shortage or the lack of qualified talent in cyber, you know, the number you hear today is there's 700,000 open jobs in cyber. And we all know, well, I mean, having done this for a little while, I think most folks know that the, the real challenge is not so much that there's not enough talent, it's that there's a huge barrier to entry to get qualified, to get into jobs, right? So folks go into cyber, great, they've got a degree, and nobody wants to hire them because they don't have the magic number of things. They don't have that CISP yet, you know, <laughs> for the entry level job. <laughs> so, um, so what we found was that helping, so bringing university into this picture and having real discussions about election cybersecurity with them in the room, help them understand what they needed to be preparing their students for when it came to the job market. Uh, so that was one thing, you know, just getting a good good look at what are the real challenges, what are the positions that these folks need, um, what are the, the skill sets um, that are necessary to support cyber risk management for the election vertical, so to speak. So that was one big win. Um, and then, you know, I think also just having their voice sort of helping to inform um, where they see issues in their own academic environment. like where they see problems, there's a lot of commonality, you know, between different industries, there's overlap. And, and, and taking the time for folks to get to the common ground of, okay, we have this problem too, what did you do about it? Because maybe you got an idea that we don't, and we'd love to hear it because we might want to go apply it to our side. That was very valuable. Yeah, and I, I think another you know key point in, in involving students in this is just teaching them about the the space, right? Um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of folks in the cybersecurity space have these patriotic motivations and really want to help um, improve lift the collective resilience of the U.S. And kind of what better way to do that than support the cybersecurity of our election administration process? But Elections, the way that we run elections in the U.S., it's a very complicated system, right? We have the 50 states who run their own elections, and, and within the states, um, the, they're mostly administered at the local level. It depends on the state, but um, so you have 8,000 plus local election jurisdictions, and every state does things a little bit differently based on their, you know, their own independent or their own individual state's needs and state culture and um, learning about that and being able to interact with the folks who are running the elections, I think has, students have really enjoyed it. I always get like really, really great feedback from the professors who bring their students out there. And um, I hear from the students who have come, you know, who have come to those events asking like, how do I get involved? What do you recommend in terms of internships to like get involved in this space? And so uh, it's exciting. I, elections are, are a challenging space, but it's an exciting space. And, and it's great to see, um, see the folks, you know, really wanting to pour, in, pour into it with their skill sets. Others? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to jump in there a little bit with what he just asked. I'm with the, the city government in Oklahoma. I'm on the state cybersecurity grant. One of the things we looked at in implementing those grants was 
uh, something that Texas A&M came up with, and that is starting a SOC that supported the local city governments. Mm -hmm. And so we are in the process over the next two to three years of building SOCs in EATNET security operations centers um, in each one of the major state institutions with the idea of getting students that foot in the door to get them that experience. You know, get a CISSP, you gotta have like five or six years of experience. You're not gonna get that in college, but you have all these companies out there wanting that thing. So now you're gonna be hiring somebody that may get two to three years working as a SOC analyst. And uh, one of our private universities actually did this internally. And over the course of the time, they were able to build up and get some really good, they started actually getting in more than just SOC analyst jobs. They started going out and doing the pen testings and that kind of thing. And so I think that's where the states can really start working with their own institutions, you know, the state um, education stuff and start building that cyber talent pool. So I just wanted to toss that in there. Great, thank you. And I know um, both states here have done a lot of work with their uh, local universities on, um, you know, bo both getting them involved and just the, the demystifying process as well, right? Um, others? Okay. Are there, are there other NAS demystifying sessions planned? And if so, how do we get involved? Great question. Um, so no, not yet. Uh, we, we've typically so far done these at our summer conferences. So our last one just happened last month um, in, the, in our July summer conference. And we plan two conferences per year. Um, but open to ideas and folks who want to get involved. Um, my contact information is here, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, like I said, we, we've done these three, event, three events and we're kind of looking for, is the, is the best approach continuing this model, um, maybe doing something a little bit different moving forward? So I, I'm happy to hear from others and, and ha have ideas. And, and also states are doing some of this stuff themselves, right? In, in state events, uh, Iowa does their um, what left of boom event, um, and, and so you know even whether it's NAS events or, or getting you con connected with some of our members, we'd be happy to hear from you. Are there other questions or feedback? Okay, uh, go ahead. All right. So when you guys are interacting with uh, folks in the cyber research community, right, and they say, hey, they look at some tech that you've got, um, which is going to be a lot of tech, right, because you have to have a lot of voting machines. And they say, hey, I found something for you. How difficult is it for you to actually implement a fix? Is it as easy as a phone call? Or are you like now you know, talking to vendors and sourcing and talking to people about funding? Like, Is this a big turn or, or a pretty easy turnaround? So I'll give kind of a, a quick overview. And then if anybody wants to weigh in, they can. But um, you know, everybody's mind goes immediately to the voting, vote casting, and tabulation systems, which the manufacturers of those systems play, play a big role in, in, I think, the question that you're asking there. But what our members have been more focused on, and I think for good reason, which we could talk about, is are the internet connected systems that support election administration. So we're talking uh, voter registration systems, election management systems, uh, websites that share election information. And so their vulnerability disclosure policies when a, when a secretary's office has them, um, th that's the scope of those and, and those are the systems where they're able to implement changes whether it's working with their vendor or um, in-house developers. But does anyone else want to weigh in on that? And this doesn't probably answer your question but one of the things that we need to do is reassure the public and so what we've done in the state of Iowa, Secretary Pate has put together with the legislature uh, after each election we have the vote counting machines, we, we have a, a, the physical ballots we actually go in and we do a uh, hand count of in each county, one precinct, and they just, you know, with their finger, one, two, three, four, five, and they match it against the machine. And so, again, we have confidence. We want to kind of ensure confidence. But we're also, again, we have the VDP so that if you do find something, you know, we, we want to be able to see that and respond to that and, and work with that. But again, uh, just with the machines, and, and not every state does it, but, but I think most of the states do. They do an audit to make sure that those paper ballots match with those machine counts, 
And I think the majority of the time, I, I, I'm not sure if I've heard it where they haven't matched. So we have pretty high confidence from that level. Yeah, it's, it's really important to, you know, understand the difference between the, the internet connected systems that support elections and, and these vote casting and tabulation systems. The, really, the latter have a lot of, you're able to implement a lot of resiliency into the process through things like paper and auditing that the paper ballots or pa the paper trail so that, um, you know, t to to instill confidence, but also to ensure accuracy, right? Um, the internet connected systems, those are not connected to the voting systems and, and they're separate, but they're still very important, right? They're still very important to the process and they're what we know has been the target of adversaries in the past. And so um, it, it's really, it has to be an effort for, for both of these things. And I, I know we're almost out of time, so I really want to go down the line one more time, just in the spirit of collaboration, um, any like last minute thoughts, um, encouragement for the folks in the room, lessons learned that you want to share, just quick, quick note, we have two minutes to go. I'll go to Jack. I'll keep it short, I'll say really just get involved. Um, there's so many opportunities now, whether it's participating in a vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty. Um, if your state doesn't have one, get uh, talk to them, um, encourage them to set one up. Um, there's all sorts of other opportunities. Um, get in contact with Lindsay at NAS. Um, I'll plug at CISA. We also have a number of um, opportunities to get involved. We have a session tomorrow where you can provide feedback on some guidance we're putting out on Secure by Design. Uh, we put out a request for information on open source security um, as well. So please do get involved, um, get your opinions in, and we can collaboratively do better here. I think I just want to say we appreciate the research community you know that's uh, there's the landscape is changing i think for you for us we're trying to learn and i think one of our goals has been how do we work towards cyber maturity we're no we know we're not there the minute i say we're there one of you guys is going to prove us wrong uh, so we're just moving in that direction of cyber maturity and uh, continuing to improve and continuing to learn um, from you guys and and uh, from uh, experts in this this field I just want to say that um, thanks to Mike's leadership, Lindsay's uh, continued shepherding of this project, you're seeing, what you see is a multi-year project uh, that has made some impact and has helped inform and educate and bring together people to collaborate on a problem that, that overlaps multiple disciplines. And I, I just want to second that. And as well, if you do want to get involved, please contact uh, NAS. They can get you to whatever state uh, that, that you, you represent. And then uh, as well, uh, if, if you are a student and you're looking to, to get even more involved, look at Scholarship for Service. Uh, it's not just uh, for federal service. You can also uh, relate that to state service as well. Uh, so that's one way to get some education paid and be involved at the same time. <laughs>